Have you ever had the occasion where someone comes to you or you're talking to someone about Christian things and they say, no, 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 I can't accept all of that stuff because I've prayed and my prayers weren't answered. Are unanswered prayers an actual problem, either for unbelievers looking at Christianity or for Christians? Do they struggle with the question of unanswered prayers? Well, if they do, we have the answers. Not, not to the prayers, but to the question of unanswered prayers with the Dean of Sydney, <laughs> Philip Jensen. Philip. Hello, Kel. Nice to chat to you again. We need a bit of background, so take us to what it is that prayer actually is. Uh, well, there's two things. The word prayer itself just means asking. So when I pray, I ask. It's the old English word, I pray thee, tell me what you want to know. Yes. Um, and it just means to ask. There's half a dozen different Greek and Hebrew words that, that are translated prayer, but every one of them means asking. Uh, theologically, prayer is um, faith expressed or faith articulated. It's, it's expressing my confidence in God. So I'm saying, God, I can't do this. Please, will you do this for me? And so I'm putting it in his hands. So it's trusting him. But it, it's a trust that is expressed. So when I ask God for something, I am trusting him. My well, basic relationship is one of trust. Prayer is that trust speaking. Speaking it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We, and we pray with confidence and we pray with hope. We pray with confidence because... Well, we pray with confidence and, and sometimes we pray with hope. But we don't pray with command. Right. So prayer itself is always asking. It's never telling. Right. Uh, some people talk about prayer as talking to God. And there's, there's no problem with talking with God if you want to talk to God. It's just not necessarily prayer. It's like thanksgiving is not necessarily prayer. You, so you pray with thanksgiving. Yes, yes. Because you're not asking for anything. In fact, that's a good thing to do. And talking to God is a good thing to do. But, but it is alarming in church sometimes when people get up and thank God for this, this, this and this and never get around to asking for anything. Yes. You really want to say, we yes. need to be giving our problems to God and asking for that's things. That's right. Well, I went to one prayer meeting where we collected up prayer points and then they asked one person to lead in prayer. And he thanked God for giving us the things we'd mentioned, <laughs> which was, well, it was rude in a sense because God hadn't been asked. Yes. And he had no assurance that God was going to give us those things that were being mentioned. And Sometimes that's a, a, a definite policy of people. It was they, with him. They express confidence that God will do whatever yes. we ask. And that's not praying because that's not asking. Right. That really is, is claiming. And in fact, it's always commanding. In fact, I've got a book at home that says that uh, misquotes the King James Version on Isaiah, uh, telling us that you've got to command me concerning the works of my hands. Right. If you read it in context, it's a, a, it's a rhetorical question that God asks the people. Are you commanding me concerning the works of my hand? But right. this author has taken it as an invitation to command God concerning the works of the hands and saying, in prayer, we should tell God what he should do. Well, that's, that's uh, an appalling arrogance. And it reverses the roles. Yes. Suddenly God is not God anymore. No. I'm calling the shots. He's a servant. He, he's less than a genie in a bottle. He's, mm. He just, whatever you ask of me, O oh master, I will do for you. Well, that's not God, not the God of the Bible. Yep. Okay. So it's asking, it's not commanding, it's mm. asking, and it's, and it's our faith speaking out loud. And we do, yes. we've got confidence. Yes. That doing this is the right thing to do. Yes, always, because God invites us to, in fact, he commands us to do this. Uh, God often commands us to do things that are good for us and enjoyable to do. <laughs> yes. We're just kind of silly. It's like, you know, take a day of rest. You know, oh, no, I like to work. But God not only gives us a day of rest, but commands us to keep it. Well, he not only welcomes us to pray to him, but he commands us to pray to him. And, and at the time we should do it is when we forget or ignore it. I mean, I've got a problem. I've got two choices. I can either worry or pray. Oh, what yes, do I do? What, what do I, I do? do? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just that he tells us to, it's also his character. We are talking about and to a promise keeping God. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, fundamentally lying behind this asking is the character of God, that he is our father who is loving, kind, generous, wanting us to come to him and ask of him. So there's that lovely bit that Jesus says, you know, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give yes. good gifts to those who ask? And I suppose there's also the fact that we know 
what God is about in this world. We know what the big plan of salvation is and you know what he's doing in human history. It's not as though we have to guess what the secret plan is or you know, something no. of that sort. Uh, and we can come to know more. Well, he reveals his plan to us and we're called upon to learn what pleases the Lord. So as you grow in Christian life and come to have a transformed mind knowing the, the nature and character of God and his plans and purposes, so your prayers can more and more align to what God is wanting to do. So we know God cares for the widows and the orphans. And so I know to pray for widows and orphans in their distress and in their difficulty, just as I know I should be visiting them in their distress and their difficulties. But to praying for them fits very much with the character and plans and purposes of God. I know God wants all nations to hear the gospel. So I can pray for missionaries everywhere, knowing I'm praying in accordance with the plans of God. And as well as having confidence, we can pray with hope. And that means praying with Christian hope, not that worldly notion when we, we use hope in a worldly sense, mm -hmm. which is wishing it happens. Mm -hmm. it, we can pray with real Christian confident hope, can't we? Yes, we can. Uh, I, I agree with you about the idea of hope. Our hope is, it, is more an expectation yes, yes. than just hope. but. Uh, in our prayers, there are some things over which we have greater certainty and expectation than other things. So, uh, I'm told that if I ask for forgiveness in the name of the Lord Jesus, I will be forgiven. Yes, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So, yes. I, can, I can be sure of that. Likewise in James, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of him. Without double-mindedness, ask and it will be given to you. So, I can seek wisdom, I can seek forgiveness, knowing precisely I'm going to get those things. But I don't know whether my cousin is going to become a Christian or not. Right. That is not in the scriptures. That's not revealed to me in the scriptures. So my hope is that he will or she will, but my um, expectation that they will is not the same. So the word, I don't know what's a better word uh, than hope, because in modern English, hope is the right word. Biblically, hope would be more an expectation. I don't have the expectation. But I have the desire that they would become Christian. And it's not inconsistent with the mind of God or the character of God to bring them to himself. And it's not inconsistent with his plan because he wants all men to come to a faith and to find forgiveness. And he would approve of me asking for that and That's right. doing whatever I'm doing to help that happen. But I haven't got a revealed promise that it's going to happen, right. nor do I have a revealed plan that yes, each one of your cousins, Philip, will become Christian. Right. I don't know that. We, we, there is a thing that we, I suppose some of our prayers are a bit more general. If I'm about to speak at a men's breakfast, I'm praying that God will change people there. Right? And I can be confident that God uses the gospel to do that because that's what he says his gospel yes, is for. Yes, his word will never go forth without coming back, to yes. fulfilling its purpose. So, so I can confidently pray, you know, turn hearts of stone into hearts of flesh change people today, that use your gospel to do that, without specifically saying, you know, convert this person and make it happen today? Yes and no. That is, he also says his word hardens people's hearts. Yes, yes. So I can't expect that my, uh, the answer I want is the answer I'll be given. Mind you, if I'm then praying and, and in the process glorify either your mercy or your justice, it's going to happen. Well, that's true. That's true. But there's nothing wrong with asking what I want. Yes, yes. My heart to. is that this happens. My yes. heart is that they, uh, that they will be softened. I don't right. want this group of people to be hardened against your word, so please soften them. Okay. Now, we are getting towards unanswered prayer. We'll get there in just a tick. We're, we're <laughs> laying groundwork. Do we put in the qualification of your will be done? There are some people who have a problem with that. Yes, some people do. And, of course, you, your basic problem with, with the problem is that Jesus uses it. Yes. So that's a basic problem. And the other thing is you have to throw out the Lord's Prayer. You can't pray that again if you yes. don't like that. <laughs> that's right. Whenever we're praying, we're really asking God's will to be done. Yes. That's asking God to be God. Asking God to be God. So if I, if I pray, I want this problem, stress, anxiety, whatever it is, to go away. I really want it to go away. But in the end, I want what God, and if God thinks that me going through this process is going to make me a little bit more like Jesus, then... In the end, That's what he decides thing. is going That's to be right. the best thing to happen. That's right. So Jesus really didn't want to die. I mean, he was praying that the cup be removed from him, that the hour be passed by him, that 
in Matthew's Gospel, it's if there is any other way. Right. <laughs> but nevertheless, I want your will, not my will done. Which brings us to the question of unanswered prayer. Um, when people have said it to me, people have said, oh, my prayers weren't answered. My, my answer has been, you, you can't dictate the answer. You do the prayer, you don't do the answer. It's God who does the answer. Yes, uh, that's a key part of it, isn't it? But you can hear how some people would say, but if you say, if your will be done, then what's the point of praying? Because his will's going to be done anyway. Mm. And so you ask, but it really makes no difference because it's going to happen anyway. And that's a fatalism which is different to the Bible's faith in God. That is, God does hear our requests and sometimes he gives to us because we ask and he would not give to us because we didn't ask. See, in James chapter 4 it says, you, you, you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you ask for the wrong reasons to spend on your passion. So there's a couple of reasons there why we don't get things. One is because we don't pray and the other is because we pray wrongly. But dealing with the first one is important. That is, to say, nevertheless, your will be done, is not to negate the, the genuineness of the question of asking for something, because God's will includes our requests to do things. And I feel comfortable with the notion that I'm presenting the problem to God and saying, this is too big for me, please fix this. Yes. Knowing that he might say yes, or he might say no, or he might say later, and whatever he says, Will be the I best. will know what is best. It will be the best. Uh, I won't necessarily know and see it at the time will be best because I think I know best. Yes, yes. Uh, but it will be for the best. But uh, sometimes uh, he will not give it to me because I didn't ask for it. Yes, okay. So, so the first step is we need to ask, if we feel yes. that prayer has been unanswered, what do we do? Then we pray again, generally. Okay. That's what I do. Uh, <laughs> that is, not only do I want the answer to be yes, I want the answer to be yes now. <laughs> yes. Um, especially that prayer about please make me patient. Immediately. <laughs> what was Augustine's please pa make me chaste but not quite yes. Yes, I mean there, there are silly prayers we pray sometimes, yes. aren't they? But I, we do want our answers. We want them in our terms. We want them to be yes and we want them immediately. Right. And so when you say our prayers are unanswered, what, which of these aspects are unanswered, you know, yes, that yes. it hasn't happened already, it might happen tomorrow or next year or the year after, who knows when it's going to happen. And so uh, praying it again is something to be done. See, the Lord Jesus prayed three times. Uh, Paul prayed three times. The, the thorn to be with her. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with praying again. In fact, if you really feel it, you will. But Matthew 6 Lots and lots of prayer doesn't somehow make it more likely no, that we get what we right. want that's when right. we, we want it. We can't manipulate God by right. saying, well, I've spent three hours here now, God. You've <laughs> got to do it because, you know, I'm three hours on my knees. I mean, this is really bad. I'll be happy to pray for my knees soon. Um, God is not manipulated. He's not impressed by the length of our words or the, the length of our prayers or the complexities of our sentences or the number of Bible verses we pepper our prayer with. None of those. Th there's no way you can manipulate God. Uh, and we mustn't try to do so by prayer. Some of the people, who, I once knew a chap who thought you could because he thought when you pray, there's a trick to it. Yes. And he thought the trick to it was fasting because if you yes. pray uh, with, with fasting, fast. then you'll get, a, get the answer you want. And if you right. don't, well, you might, you might not. So some people think there is a trick to yes, it. Yes, they, they do. And that just, I don't mean to be rude to your friend, but that's, that, that means they haven't understood the character of God. Right. God does not play tricks and he doesn't need tricks to be played on him and there's no technique. Right? The, the only technique is we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the technique. We call our God a Father because of Jesus. And as well as saying yes or no or later, sometimes God surely says, but in my way. Yes. I was thinking of yes, those godly right. Jews who before the birth of Jesus kept praying for the coming of the Messiah and they got a, a Messiah they didn't expect. Yes. Uh, well, Cyrus is one of those too. The Babylonian, the, the Jews were taken off into Babylonia and God promises to send them a Messiah they would never expect, namely Cyrus. It's in Isaiah 45. Well, Cyrus is the pagan Persian king. Uh, that a pagan would be the Messiah is almost offensive to the Jew. <laughs> But yet God was showing he was saving them. His I'm way. in charge. He's in charge. Yes. And they need to learn to expect the Messiah that he sends rather than the Messiah they want. 
Okay, let, let's analyze these kinds of prayers that we feel are unanswered prayers. Uh, take me back to the James 4 because you touched on well, that lightly. The first is we didn't ask. Okay. We fought instead of asking. Second is we asked for the wrong reasons to spend on our passions. Yes. And we're double minded. We want God, but we really want the things of this world. Sometimes in that regard, of course, we're praying for the wrong things. So I'm praying for the Rolls Royce. I really want a Rolls Royce. I really want a Ferrari. I really want them. There's nothing wrong with those things per se, but there's no promise from God that we would get them. And there's every reason to think that prosperity will not be ours. Um, in the Psalms, it says, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not listen to me. Right. And so sometimes my prayers are expressions of my sinfulness rather yes. than godliness. I'm asking for ungodly things or in an ungodly way, in a self-centered way. You know, I, I pray that you might fail so that I can be, you know, I, mean, I pray that my mother-in-law might, well, it can be a very bad prayer. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And God does not answer those prayers. And he doesn't use answering prayers to reinforce our sinful desires. I mean, David does sometimes in the psalm look as though he's asking God to strike down his enemies. We wouldn't do that today. Uh, no, I, they're the I enemies. I hope I'm not raising a, a furphy here. But no, no, no. But the enemies of the Messiah are slightly different to the enemies of you and me. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> the, Take the, that on board. Yes, yes, the enemies are the enemies of... The, when they're the enemies of David, they're, they're enemies of the Messiah. Yes, yes. And that's of a different character. But also the gospel is so different. It is one of the New Testament, Old Testament differences that uh, we are longing for the conversion of our enemies. Yes, love our enemies. Yes. Could our prayers be unanswered because what we're asking is, is against God's character? We're, not, we're asking God yes. to do something which is not in his character. Yes, that's right. We can. And uh, anything that we're praying for for sin would be of that character. Right. You know, I mean, God says, do not covet. And yes. so when we pray, our prayers are expressing our covetousness. <laughs> then of course, we can't expect that God will be saying yes to reinforce our covetousness. Um, uh, prayers of hatred, prayers of uh, adultery, prayers of, of uh, bearing false witness, help me to tell this lie. God finds lying lips are an abomination to him. So sometimes we're going to say, I've prayed, it looked to me as if there wasn't an answer, and I can now go back and do this kind of thinking you've yeah. been doing, and I can see there's a reason for yeah. it. But and, and sometimes I didn't at the time think it was sinful and out of the character of God right. because I didn't know enough. Yes. But down the track, I realise, actually, I should never have prayed that, given who God is. Right. But sometimes we're going to, we're going to um, pray, feel as though we haven't got an answer, and no matter how we examine it or how much we understand, we can't see a reason. Yes. That's baffling, isn't it? We, that is baffling. When, when someone we know and love is not converted or whatever... A friend of uh, mine died of cancer. Yeah. A friend of ours. And yeah. uh, I could not see any reason why he should have cancer as opposed to me or yes, anybody yes, else. Yes. And he was a fine Christian man doing all kinds of valuable, important things for our community. And yet he died. Now, that, uh, I prayed that God would heal him. I prayed repeatedly that God would heal him, and he didn't. So does that mean we need to step back and say, I can't see why, but God does what's best. Yes. And I just have to trust that God is doing what's That's best. That's right. And nowhere in the plan of God does it say that all people with cancer will be cured, or all Christians will be cured, or that anybody who prays for cure will be cured. We haven't got those promises, and we haven't got the plan of God that that's what's going to happen. That doesn't mean we can't ask for it, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't thank God when it happens. But I have no reassurance that anybody with a particular disease is going to be cured at any particular time. Which sort of brings us to Paul's thorn in the flesh. Yes. Uh, that Paul had presumably some sort of illness or physical problem. We don't know what it was. but We don't know what the thorn in the flesh no. was at what, all. Whatever it was, he asked for it to be taken away three times and yes. the answer was no. Yes, yes, that's right. That's so what, if it caused some sort of suffering, that was part of what God thought was yes. best for him. And what's more, it was called a messenger of Satan. Right. That God had, and furthermore, it's called that God has afflicted him with this messenger of Satan. Right. So see, we have this dualism, Satan, God, if Satan's doing it, God's not, and, and vice versa. But right. that's not true in the scriptures. God uses Satan to bring about his good purposes. 
such as in the crucifixion. The evil men doing dreadful things under the influence of Satan, which was God's purpose for salvation of mankind, because God is sovereign even over, especially over Satan. Yes. So Saul has, Paul has this, this messenger of Satan that he asks God to remove. It's a bad thing that he doesn't want, that's hurting him, that is painful to him. But in God's purposes, it's actually better for him to have it. Right, okay. Because but, and he won't necessarily understand why at the time. No, he, he does explain why, but it's a general why, not a specific why. Right. That is, the general why is because God's power is seen in our weakness, not in our strength. And so Paul is not the super apostle going around striding the earth, conquering by the power of his rhetoric. Paul is a weak and beaten man who does remarkable things because... God is doing remarkable God things is doing through remarkable him. things through him. Yes. And it's always this danger of the great preacher, the people coming out saying, oh, you're a terrific preacher. When they say that to you, you know you failed very badly because <laughs> yes. they're supposed to come in and say, you've got a terrific God. That's yes. a, the Lord Jesus is marvellous. Yes. Then you are a terrific preacher. <laughs> but as long as you have them praising the preacher, they've missed the point. Yes. Seriously. Part of what understanding what Paul understood at that point is to see that suffering has a place. Suffering can be used as a tool by God. because. There are, there are people who say suffering has no place and if you want to be healed, you should be healed and if you're not healed, you're not asking God. And they say suffering can have no place in God's plan. Do we need to say suffering can have a place in God's plan? It's God's choice, as it were. Yeah, I think you've undersold it when you say suffering can have. Suffering right. does have. Right. Because we are the people of the suffering Messiah. Yes. Our salvation a, depends on his suffering. It's a central part of our message is yes. weakness, frailty, suffering and pain. That's a central part of our message. We glory in the cross. And we ourselves, are, Paul talks in the same, the same book, 2 Corinthians, we're earthen vessels, uh, frail, weak and shown to be weak, in order that the transforming power of God might be seen to be of God, not of us. And so Paul, a man who had been caught up to the third heaven, is not impressive. He's weak, frail, and, and, and fragile, vulnerable, hurt by Satan. But God will not take that away from him because God does not want him conceited, doesn't want him overbearing, doesn't right. want him to be arrogant. And, All and of which is likely if, if you have no problems. Which is why Paul can then say, in the cross of Christ I glory. Yes. Yeah. Not in the skills or abilities or the number right. of converts or whatever. That's right. And we keep seeing that in, in the, uh, the write-ups of the televangelist, of the, the great preachers of the rest of it. I, I, I hate it when people introduce me in grandiloquent terms when I'm speaking somewhere because they should listen to me because God's word is going to be spoken, not because I've got a great power of speaking. You know, powerful preaching is either false or true. It's false if the power lies in the preaching. It's true if the preaching is the word of God, which is powerful. So suffering is central to God's activity in this world, yes. central to God's plans. Therefore, if I'm suffering and I go to God, now, it's still okay for me to say what I want is for the suffering to go away. This really Absolutely. hurts. Absolutely. So it's still okay to say yeah. that. Paul did three times. But I can't claim some sort of promise that it will go away. That's absolutely right. And ultimately, we're all going to die. And we die of some malfunction of an organ. So if, if uh, God's always going to heal and always going to cure, we should be seeing the apostles around here somewhere. <laughs> You know, they'd be yes. very old, but they'd still they'd be here. Yes. The virtue of the fact they're not here. They and they'd have die. no arthritis and they'd, they'd be doing fine. But it's not, it's not happening because no. there's no promise that we're going to avoid death, nor the, 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 the failures of our bodies, which always hurt. Yes. I'm, I, I get told. I get told by people, by his stripes we are healed, so I can claim a promise and, you know, the, therefore I'm going to be healed. Uh, as if that was something that applies here and now, this minute, and I shouldn't have to suffer any longer. And it does apply, uh, but it's just not the now. No, it's uh, Revelation 21, perhaps. It, it, it may be now. Yes. Whatever healing I have, 
It's the healing of the Lord Jesus Christ to which I rejoice and give thanks. And whenever I'm sick, I always pray for the healing. And the more painfully I'm sick, the more urgently and earnestly I pray. It seems to me one of the things that comes out of this is if we are in a position where we feel a prayer has been unanswered, there may well be a lesson for us to learn yes. by thinking yes. about that and looking at that. As in many things like that, it's the, it's the negative which actually gets us to deep, more deeply think through the issues right. about, well, hang on, what am I actually praying? Why is it that God is not? Now, sometimes I can't find the answers to why this prayer is not answered the way I hoped, expected, when I wanted, and this one was. I, sometimes I can't think, but sometimes I can look back and say, yes, but Philip, that was a self-seeking prayer that really was not seeking God's glory and was not of any help. And the Apostle Paul could think back and say, because, well, more than think back, he had a word from God on the subject, my grace is sufficient for you. Yes, yes. So he knew why it was that, uh, that he had to rely upon grace, the grace of God, because in weakness was the power of God demonstrated. Which means for us, the better we know Scripture, the more likely we are to see what's going on, sure. Yes, and to understand, because we know God's character better, we know his plans and purposes, we know his promises better. Um, but, and so we will be able to understand what's happening with our prayer life better. So when we see an unanswered prayer and we're puzzled by it, in the end, is it, is it that God wants us to be content with where we are at the moment, knowing that he is wise and he is in charge? Is contentment a goal in that sense? It's one of the goals. He also wants us to have faith and confidence in him that he will change and control things. So the trouble with only saying content, which is not what you were doing, but the, the trouble with saying only contentment, it becomes something of a cop out from ever thinking that your prayer is going to change anything. Yes, yes. Whereas prayer does change things have because to have our, gods, yes. our God can change. And he wants us to express our faith in him and to have confidence that he will be looking after us and doing the best for us and will do things in response to our prayers. Right. So there's that side as well. But it does teach us to, to be content. If I've prayed for this repeatedly and it's not given to me. Well, then maybe I need to learn to live without it. So there's a lot there that we can, we can talk about and think about. It may well be this would be a good video to have a look at with your prayer and Bible study group and talk about these issues, about what it is that God is doing and trusting his wisdom in all things. So th there is a lot to wrestle with in this There issue. is, especially in a prayer group. <laughs> Indeed there is. Uh, Philip, thank you for that. It's a pleasure. And thank you for your company once again on The Chat Room.